Maggie, our viewers out here know you not only someone who cares about culture, but mm. you're also as a reporter in tune with what's happening around the world. And uh, we're watching with horror the um, things that have been taking place in the last month mm -hmm. uh, and even before that uh, in, um, in Iraq yes. and in that whole area that we over a decade now have been focusing on because of war and conflict and terrorism. Um, uh, it, uh, we, we, we have some connections, though, that we, we want to talk about, uh, uh, you know, and talk to in the next few moments. So allow me to, to, to mm -hmm. introduce this, if I may. Um, we're approaching the International Day of Prayer. I believe it's November the 9th. November 9th. And um, one particular group that urgently needs our prayers internationally would be our brothers and sisters inside Iraq, as ISIS, or the Islamic State, as they're being called continues to wreak havoc on Christ followers inside Iraq. Many believers are being killed simply because of what they believe in, which is causing many more to flee the country. Voice of the Martyrs reporter Greg Musselman was recently in Iraq, and he brings us this report. Baghdad, like many parts of Iraq, is like a war zone. And with the pullout of U.S. troops, the situation has become even more dangerous for everyone living there, for Christians and Muslims alike. In the aftermath of the U.S.-led invasion in 2003, Christians were targeted throughout the country as an infidel minority accused of having ties to the West. St. George's Church in the Iraqi capital, led by Canon Andrew White, have had more than a thousand people killed from their church in the past 10 years. The British-born minister dubbed the vicar of Baghdad, who was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis 15 years ago, which affects his speech and mobility, says he has no intention of leaving Baghdad in spite of the dangers facing Christians. And the attacks and the opposition isn't overt and always obvious, but it's always there, just under the surface. At every level in society, Christians are Christians. They're a minority, they're to be sidelined, and they are people who are considered at great risk because they do not follow the way of the majority of people here who follow either Shia or Sunni Islam. I'm standing in front of the historic Tigris River in the ancient and war-torn city of Baghdad. Christianity goes all the way back to the first century in this part of the world. In the mid-1990s, there were more than 1.2 million Christians here. But with war and terrorism and direct attacks against Christians, a million Christians or more have left the country since that time, decimating the church. And where have they gone? They've gone to Sweden, Detroit, Chicago and Canada and we want them here. Andrew White encourages the Christians to stay in Iraq. And I say to them, I'm not going to leave you. Please don't leave me. But it's easy to understand why Christians still in the country want to leave. Rebecca and Ali had been married for over two decades and were raising their three children in Mosul, a large city in the northwest, located on the west bank of the Tigris River, opposite the ancient Assyrian city of Nineveh. Rebecca says her husband was a gifted photographer who owned his own business, known as a kind, friendly man who loved God and his family. Ali was well respected and liked by everyone, even those who disagreed with his Christian faith. We loved each other and were together for seven years before we got married and were married for 22 years. There was not one day he wasn't good to me. I felt I had the best husband in the world. My father was very special. Everybody loved him. Everyone in the neighborhood liked him. He was my dad, but even more, he was my friend. We had no secrets. He gave me advice and even when I did something wrong, he would show me the right way. He was very close to me. Ali grew up in an Orthodox Chaldean family, but would join an evangelical house church in 2009. It was during that time he became more passionate about his faith in Jesus Christ. Rebecca and Ali, like most Iraqis, lived in fear and uncertainty, not knowing what would happen next after years of war and violence. 
Yet despite all this, Rebecca says the Holy Spirit gave them peace and adds that when Ali experienced the Holy Spirit in a powerful way, his life was dramatically changed. There was a big difference. It was like a bomb. He became like a bomb. He prayed every day for three hours from midnight until three o'clock. He would come and wake me and say, let's pray together. He asked that we be filled with the Holy Spirit. He felt God had put the healing gift in his hands. He prayed for sick people. As a result, Ali had an insatiable desire to lead Muslims to Jesus, even going to the mosques to tell them about the gospel. In this photo taken in 2011, he was praying over Mosul, one of the most violent cities in Iraq, where Christians are often singled out for attacks by militant Muslims. Between January and March of 2012, Ali led seven Muslims to Christ and brought his first convert from Islam home with him to wash his feet. Ali's boldness also drew the attention of Islamists who wanted to silence him. While he didn't tell Rebecca, she believes her husband was warned many times to stop telling Muslims about Christ. Ali was kidnapped on March 19, 2012 and was tortured for three days before being shot nine times. Rebecca's pastor warned her not to open the casket to see her husband's bullet-riddled body, but she did anyway. He told me that they shot him five times in the head. I said, no, I want to see him. So they opened the casket. When I saw him, I saw a big smile on his face. After that, they closed it and we got ready to take him to his village. When they took him to the church, a lot of people were saying bad things about those who killed him. But I didn't accept that into my heart. I was praying for those people who killed him. I am proud of him because he died for Jesus. Greg, thank you for that great report informing us on what's been happening in Iraq. Can you give us an update on what's been happening inside the country and uh, what it is that Christians are doing to protect themselves? Well, John, as you know, the situation in Iraq is very chaotic and very violent. And, of course, we're very concerned about the Christians that have not been able to make it into the northern part of the country, into Kurdistan. And just with the barbaric tactics of ISIL and being Christians being one of the groups that they target, it's very, very dangerous for them. Now, even for the Christians that have made it into places like Erbil in Kurdistan and in the surrounding areas, I mean, they're living in the open, just trying to find any kind of shelter. Uh, you know, there's also open buildings where they're trying to, you know, have the whole family. So it's a very, very difficult situation. Uh, one of our contacts there talking to the Christians, he said 95% of them just want to get out of the country. They want to leave. They say it's just too dangerous. I mean, since 2003, more than a million Christians have fled the country. So the Christian community in Iraq is shrinking drastically. Greg, as we heard the story of Rebecca in your report, how is she? Well, Magdalene, when I first heard that Mosul had fallen to ISIL, I was, you know, very concerned. Uh, she's just a wonderful lady. She already lost her husband, raising three children by herself, and she was committed to staying in Mosul and spreading the gospel. But, of course, uh, once these militant Islamists went in there, they had to flee the area. And so we hadn't heard, you know, what had happened to them for several weeks. But I can report that our partners up in the uh, Erbil area in Kurdistan are looking after the family. In fact, some good news. Uh, the oldest daughter is going to be getting married soon. And as I say, she wanted to stay in Iraq, but the situation there is so dangerous, she's now hoping to get out of the country. Now, we hear you're currently in Pakistan, where we know Christians are persecuted there as well. What's the current situation in that country? Well, the situation in Pakistan is always difficult for evangelicals, maybe not in the news like, say, Iraq or Nigeria. But the believers here are in such a small minority of the population. Over 95% of Pakistan is Muslim, 2% are Christian, most are Catholic, so the evangelical community is very small. Now, I was here uh, teaching at an evangelical Bible college. We had 30 students who are preparing to go into some of the most dangerous areas, Taliban and those kinds of places where militant Islam is a real problem. And we also had nine pastors come, mostly from the north, and they were telling me stories of how they've been tortured, shot. Uh, one pastor they tried to run over uh, when he was riding his motorcycle uh, and he was also telling me that he'd brought seven Muslims to the Lord and one of those believers when it was found out by his family that he left Islam to become a Christian killed him 
you know, terrible situations like that. Uh, there's dozens of Christians in prison on these blasphemy cases. Of course, everyone's pretty familiar with the Asia Bibi situation. Uh, she has been in, in prison for, well, four years now, and uh, she's been given the death sentence uh, for blasphemy, and she continues to wait on appeal. So overall, things are very hard for the believers in Pakistan, especially the ones that are wanting to bring the gospel forward. But I can tell you that there are many that are doing just an amazing job to advance God's kingdom in this country. How can we continue to help our persecuted brothers and sisters all over the world this year as we um, observe the International Day of Prayer? You know, over the last dozen years, I've traveled to countries all over the world and have interviewed hundreds of persecuted Christians. And when I ask them, when I go back to Canada, what do you want me to tell your brothers and sisters? And what, what, what do you need? And even ahead of Bibles and literature and even practical things like food and those kinds of supplies, number one is always prayer. So the most important thing we can do for our persecuted brothers and sisters in Iraq and Nigeria and Pakistan and the many countries around the world is to pray and to pray intelligently. And I would encourage people to go to the Voice of the Martyrs website at persecution.net, sign up for the monthly newsletter, read stories of persecuted Christians, not only what they've going through and suffering, but also the incredible victories that they have. And, and that way you can really join with your brothers and sisters in Christ. The Bible says that if one part of the body suffers, we all suffer. So pray for your brothers and sisters in Christ and as the Holy Spirit leads you to help them. Thank you so much, Greg, for your time. Well, thank you guys and really appreciate your concern for the persecuted church. God bless you from Pakistan. And God bless you, Greg. Um, such disturbing news. Yeah. And our brothers and sisters in Christ are under uh, great persecution there. Every year we bring up the International Day of Prayer because there is an urgency to pray mm -hmm. for our brothers and sisters. We have the luxury here in North America that we don't have to... We don't deal with this on a regular basis. Not we, at this scale. No. no. And so when we hear these stories of uh, people being beheaded, we hear of the story of uh, Miriam Ibrahim mm -hmm. earlier this year in Sudan, who was uh, imprisoned because she decided to become a Christian. Yeah. This is urgent. This is a need that we, we have to focus on praying for our brothers and sisters. And that date is November the 9th, the International Day of Prayer. And our hope and our desire is that you'll join us here. Mm -hmm as well as other places of worship or in your small group or among friends that you'll pray for our brothers and sisters around the world who are experiencing a persecution. And, and even as we're talking here, Maggie, uh, the loss of life yes. at an amazing, amazing rate. Um, now, John, you were in Iraq a yeah. couple of years ago. Yeah, I've been in Iraq and uh, had the opportunity to um, be there really it's the way time gets by mm. uh, in the height of the military conflict uh, with the United States and in the country. And while I was there uh, with our uh, EQUIP team from Atlanta, my former uh, life of, of teaching Christian leaders around the world, uh, we went to Erbil, which mm -hmm. is uh, in uh, the area of Kurdistan in mm -hmm. northern Iraq. Yeah. And we taught about 200 Christian leaders who were concerned about their country, but they were experiencing what they thought the aftermath of being with Saddam Hussein, who had been extremely hard on, on the believers, not to the extent that you're seeing, I think, with... Uh, uh, ISIS yes. today. But they were having a, a, a tremendous uh, uh, exuberant excitement thinking that they would be able to um, you know, grow their churches. Mm -hmm. And I, we worked there with a Christian Missionary Alliance Church. We worked there with a Baptist church. We worked there with a Methodist church. And we talked to these pastors who had been under the old way and now they were encouraged about the new way. And they were hopeful. Yeah. And this uh, report now uh, fast forward to today where you're seeing the evacuation take place. They li literally are fleeing for their lives. Yeah, he says over a million Christians have fled. And they've had their own exodus yeah. and taken off. And, and we understand the reasons for that in so many, many ways. So there's much to pray about and much to be concerned with. And um, one of the things that I think helps us in life is when we find ourselves ever feeling sorry for ourselves or mm -hmm. feeling sympathetic about how how tough life is, and I'm not negating that it can be tough for so many of us. If we'll just take a moment for comparison and look at where others are in their situation, especially on the global stage, especially those that are just trying to follow Jesus Christ in a very simple childlike faith, and yet politics and uh, geopolitics gets things confused. Mm -hmm. We need to remember how much better we have it yeah. in lands uh, like Canada and the United States where there is democracy and freedom. And while we may not always agree, at least we do have an environment where we can debate and we can argue our points 
uh, with conviction, with not uh, some degree of uh, prosecution. And doesn't this challenge you and your faith? I know it challenges sure. me. When I, when I hear of, again, my brothers and sisters that are in so much harm, and I think about how I sometimes just negate my relationship with Jesus sometimes, it challenges me even yeah. more yeah. to just be adamant about standing in that. Let's pray for this group, yeah. all right? Father, we do lift up to you, our brothers and sisters in Christ, and in Iraq, we pray for them that are in Pakistan. And we pray for those Christ followers that are living in tough places all over this world. We pray that they would experience your protection. Mm -hmm. We pray that they would experience your peace. Help us to be faithful to remember them and to count our blessings for the wonderful joys that we have in being land, in lands of peace. Protect those who are in lands of war, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. And if you are in need of prayer in your own life, there's a number you can call on the screen. And Maggie and I would encourage you to call that number. It's 1-866-273-4444. That's our care center. And inside that care center, lots of prayer lines and operators and friends who would love to talk to you and encourage you about the things of God.